Brian, thank you for that kind introduction. You've been a good friend for, it's hard to believe we can say, over 20 years now, I think. I spoke with my father this morning about 7.30, and they were uh, showering up, about to go to breakfast, but he wanted me to tell you that he loves you, and he's looking forward uh, to getting back and being here with you. Uh, he's been in Florida with my mom, my three kids, my sister, her husband. There's six kids, uh, so he's had nine grandkids, he and my mother this week. I know they've enjoyed it. I'm sure they're ready to get back also, uh, get in their own beds uh, and get some rest tonight. My wife, Jean, and I are equally as excited to see our young girls uh, and our son when they return today. If you were to Google what the definition of leadership is, you would come up with hundreds of results. But simply defined, leadership is influence. If you have influence with anyone, you have leadership. God's used a lot of different people in my life to influence and lead me. There is no age requirement. There is no educational requirement to have influence. Influence does not discriminate. About seven years ago, it snowed on Christmas Day. And my oldest daughter, Haley, and some of her friends were playing outside, uh, and we were having a good time. And I was standing there with some of the other dads as we're watching the kids run and play in the snow uh, and just talking. And one boy who we lived happened to live in the middle of the street, one boy who lived at this very end of the street had gotten a Power Wheels for Christmas. And he was driving it up and down the street, but he ran out of battery at the opposite end from where he lived. And as he was pushing it back by our home and he got in front of our home, my daughter Haley said, my daddy will help you. And I sarcastically turned and looked at one of the guys I was out there uh, hanging out with and I said, she's just like her mom, always volunteering me for work. <laughs> well, Haley looked at me with those big blue eyes and she said, it's serving one another, daddy. She was five years old and I, I felt like the biggest jerk. What do you think I did? Well, I got right out there and I, I pushed that power wheel down the street as fast as I could all the way back behind that boy's house and into his garage. God uses all kinds of people to influence us for positive change. To appreciate good leadership, we must first understand what bad leadership looks like. And before we get to the passage we're going to be discussing in 2 Kings chapter 6, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. And this is right after Solomon, King Solomon dies. And you know very late in Solomon's life, he began to turn away from true God. He began to uh, worship other idols and allowed uh, idol worship uh, to take place in Israel. And if we back up just a little bit, there was a man who was a high official uh, for King Solomon. And he worked so good that Solomon put him in charge of all the labor force. His name was Jeroboam. Well, the prophet Ahiah had come to Jeroboam and prophesied that God was going to take uh, the kingdom of Israel out of Solomon's hands and give it over to King Jeroboam. And so uh, this word got out and a rebellion formed and Jeroboam had to flee Israel for his life. And so he fled down to Egypt because he was afraid Solomon was going to kill him. Well, after Solomon died, one of Solomon's sons named Rehoboam was going to be named king. So all of Israel went up and named King Rehoboam the king. And when Jeroboam got word of this, some of the other Israelites told him he came back and uh, went together with an assembly of Israel to King Rehoboam. And they went to him here in chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, Rehoboam said, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam answered him, he said, okay, go away for three days, let me think about this. And in three days, come back and I'll give you your answer. So during those three days, King Rehoboam went to some of his father's advisors. That's pretty wise, go to your father's advisor. Solomon at one time was the wisest man uh, on earth. 
And so he went to them and he said, what do you say, how do you think I should respond to Jeroboam, these Israelites who say, make the yoke uh, light on us? And they replied, today, if you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servant. This is the NIV translation, the ESV translation. It says they will serve you forever. So they encourage Rehoboam to give these people a favorable response. Be a servant to them and they will serve you forever. But Rehoboam rejected this advice and he went to some of his own advisors that were his age, some of the guys, some of his buddies that he grew up with. And he asked them, what do, how do you think I should respond to these people? What, what advice do you give me? And they gave him this advice. They said, tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid a heavy burden on you. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So three days later, Jeroboam and the other Israelites came back. And that's exactly what Rehoboam told them. He said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king didn't listen to the people. And when all of Israel, we skip down to verse 16, when all of Israel heard that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel, look after your own house, O David. And this formed a rebellion. And what resulted from this rebellion is that King Rehoboam lost 10 of the tribes of Israel they left and separated and went with King Jeroboam. And he was left only with those people who were living in Judah at that time. See, King Rehoboam, he let his pride, his ego get in his way. He was too arrogant to listen to the advice of others and to serve others, those that he was leading. And so the kingdom was divided, uh, taken away from him. Now let's look um, at some good leadership. But before we get to uh, 2 Kings, I just want you to know who Elisha was. We're going to be talking about the lessons that Elisha teaches us from leadership. But let's look exactly who was Elisha. Now, Elisha followed uh, the prophet Elijah. And so if you go to uh, 1 Kings and we look in chapter 19, starting in verse 19, this is the call of Elisha. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around Elisha. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. This is the type of person Elisha was. He was 100% sold out. This was his livelihood. He was a farmer. And so when he slaughtered his 12 oxen, there was no going back. When he burned the plowing equipment to have a barbecue and a celebration that he was about to follow Elijah, there was no turning back. He couldn't go just buy another uh, set of oxen, but he was 100% sold out. Now let's go ahead and go over to uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. So Elisha had become Elijah's attendant. And this is really important for all of us. Elisha had a mentor in Elijah. We all need a mentor. You know, I've always wanted just to, to walk under somebody great, to witness their leadership. I've never really had, I've had great opportunities to be mentored by people. But, uh, you know, some of the greatest opportunities I've had, I've been mentored by Jack Graham, Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley. I've never had the opportunity to sit at their feet and be mentored by them. 
but I get an opportunity to listen to them every day on the radio, to get to hear about how the Lord is speaking to them through Scripture, and just to get to listen to the experiences of their life and how the Holy Spirit has ministered to them. We all have that opportunity to be ministered to those type of people. But in chapter 2, uh, this tells us about Elijah. Now Elijah is about to go to heaven, and he knows this. And Elijah and Elisha were in Gilgah. And Elisha, Elijah told Elisha, Stay here, the Lord is sending me to Bethel. And Elisha already knew this is the last day I'm ever going to see Elijah. And he said, No, I'm not going to stay here. Never will I leave your side. I'm going to go with you anywhere. And so he said, Very well, come with me. And so they went on to Bethel. And while they're at Bethel, he, Elijah told Elisha, The Lord's sending me to Jericho. You stay here. And again he said, Hey, I'm, I'm never going to leave your side. I'm going to stay with you forever. And even the prophets that were there uh, in Bethel told Elisha, this is the last day you're ever going to see Elijah. And he said, I know, don't even speak of it. And so they went on to Jericho. And when they were in Jericho, there was another pro uh, assembly of prophets that said, hey, Elisha, you know this is the last day that you're ever going to see Elijah. And he said, I know, don't speak of it. And Elijah said, Elisha, stay here. I've got to go to the River Jordan. And Elisha said, I'm never going to leave your side. I'm going with you to the River Jordan. And Elijah said, very well. So they went to the River Jordan, and they got there at the water's edge. And Elijah took out his cloak and tapped it on the water, and the waters parted. And there were 50 other prophets that were watching this from a distance, 50 other eyewitnesses that watched Elijah and Elisha cross to the other side of the River Jordan on, on dry ground. And so when they got to the other side of the River Jordan, this is really important. Elijah said, What do you want me to do for you, Elisha? What can I do for you before I'm taken to heaven? And Elisha said, Let me have a double portion of your spirit. Let me be as if I'm one of your own. And Elijah told him, What you've asked for is way too hard. This is something I can't grant you. But if you see me ascend into heaven, you'll receive what you've asked for. And so as they were walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses surrounded them both in a whirlwind, came down and took Elijah and took him up into heaven. Remember, Elijah said, if you see me ascend into heaven, you'll receive what you've asked for. He wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. What does that mean? You know, Scripture tells us if we have faith as strong as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. So that double portion was really a double portion of his faith. Wouldn't our faith increase if we saw uh, chariots and, and horsemen come down and take somebody and we see uh, one of our friends ascend into heaven? I mean, we would have no doubt whatsoever that there is a God. Our faith would increase exponentially. That's exactly what happened for Elisha, and Elijah knew that. If you see these chariots, and we'll bring this, these chariots and horsemen back up here again in just a minute. And so then Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, because it had been left on the ground. He picked it up, walked back over to the River Jordan, and he said, where is the God of Elijah? And he taps it on the water, and the waters part, and he walks back over. Uh, to the other 50 prophets, and they're like, where's Elijah? Where did he go? Perhaps God dropped him down on a mountain or somewhere else, and he said, don't go look for him, but they continued to beg to go look for Elijah, and he said, very well, go look. They went and looked, and they said, we couldn't find him when they came back. He said, of course, I told you, don't go look. He saw Elijah ascend into heaven. So we see that Elisha has received a double portion of God's spirit. Let's go over, um, I just want you to know who Elisha is, who we're talking about before we get to the passage I want to cover. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, a little bit more about Elisha, I want you to know. This is one of my favorite stories. Beginning in verse 1, it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me what uh, I can do for you. What do you have in your house? So can you imagine this woman here? She is scared to death. Her husband's died. She's lost her husband. Now their creditor, they had some debt. The creditor's coming to take her two boys off to be slaves. And 
he was, the creditor would probably sell them off, maybe sell them off down to Egypt, and she would never see her sons again. Can you imagine the fear and the anxiety? She was probably trembling. She was probably weeping and just begging Elisha, Elisha, you've got to do something. You've got to save him. And so he asked her, what do you have in your house? And she said, I've got nothing. All I've got is a jar with a little bit of oil in it. And he says, okay, this is what you're to do. Go around, ask all your friends and neighbors uh, for some empty jars. Don't, he says, don't ask for just a few. Get as many as you can possibly find. And then go back to your room, go back to your house, go into your room with your two sons. Close the door and, start, and take that little jar of oil and start filling up the other jars one at a time. And so she did. She went around. She asked all her friends and neighbors. She found as many as she could uh, find and then went back uh, to her house, began to fill those up. And so can you imagine she's sitting in there with her two uh, sons, and so she begins to fill the first bottle, and that bottle's full. She sets it aside, the cap, it grabs another bottle, begins to fill that one up. It's full, sets it aside, begins to fill one after another until every bottle that they had found was full. And then she asked her son, hand me another bottle, and he said, there's no more. So then they went to Elisha and they said, Elisha, we've done what you said. We filled up all the bottles. And Elisha said, good. Go and sell those bottles and pay off your debt. But that's not all. Then he says, you and your sons can live on the rest. Wow. What a great example of how God blesses us when we're obedient to him. Imagine if this widow had just left Elisha and thought, well, how dumb is that? What, those, are, those are stupid instructions. I've got just a little oil. Okay, I'll just go next door and I'll get a couple of jars. She wouldn't have received such a big blessing, would she? But she was obedient. She went and found as many as she could find. And God rewarded her faith because not only was she able to pay off her debt and keep her sons, but she had enough to sell and they could live on the rest. Because her second worry was not only, okay, I've got to keep my sons, but now how am I going to live? My husband's gone. Uh, God just provided for her. This is the kind of person uh, that Elisha was. And I just love this story of faith. You know, it also reminds me, I believe it's in Luke chapter 8, of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And when Jesus was walking through the crowds with his disciples and people were bumping into him, all of a sudden somebody touched him and he said he felt the power go out from him. And he said, who touched me? And nobody was going to say anything. Matter of fact, this woman was scared as well. And his disciples said, just what are you talking about? We're in a crowd. Everybody's touching you. Everybody's, we're all bumping to each other. He said, no, I felt the power leave me. And so it was quiet for a little bit. And this one woman came forward scared and she said, I knew if I could just touch the hem of your cloak, I would be healed, and I felt the power, and I'm, I was healed. It was the faith. It, it was her faith. Jesus said, it was your faith that healed you. I love these stories of faith. Let's keep going through just learning more about Elisha. Just so you know what kind of person he is. Well, I, I do want to be respectful of our time. Let's go to Elisha 6, uh, starting in verse 8. It says, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Aram is actually modern day Syria today. So not much has changed in 3,000 years, has it? And so after conferring with his officers, he said, I'm going to set up my camp at such and such place. But the man of God, who was Elisha, continued to send word to the king of Israel and said, hey, beware of going down to here because Aram their army has set up a trap for you, and they're waiting there to ambush you. And so over and over, Elisha continued to warn the king of Israel about these ambushes. And so the king of Aram became so frustrated and furious that he (laughs) demanded, who is the traitor in my army? I want to know, who continues to go back and tell uh, Israel where we're setting up these traps? And so one of the officers came forward to the king of Aram and said, Oh, king, there are no traitors. It's that prophet Elisha. He tells the king of Israel even the very words you say in your own bedroom. So the king of Aram says, Go capture this man of God, Elisha, and bring him back to me. 
So they go, they find out that Elisha is in Dothan, and they go at night, and they surround the whole city. And in the morning when they wake up, Elisha's servant sees this and finds out about it, and you can imagine he goes to Elisha, and he's probably in a panic. He's probably freaking out. Uh, and he tells Elisha, Elisha, uh, the army of Aram, they've surrounded this whole city, and they're coming down to capture you. And so Elisha, he doesn't jump to hysterics. He doesn't get flustered, scared, anxious himself. What does he do? Right here. And we can begin filling this in in our outline. The very first thing Elisha says is don't be afraid. Wow. Wouldn't that instill confidence in you? If you had some bad report you had to give maybe your boss, your husband or wife or something, and you're even nervous to say it because you're worried about the response, but then you go and share it with them and they say, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Because the other thing that Elisha knew is that fear and worry and anxiety can paralyze us. It can render us so scared and useless that we're ineffective for do, doing anything for the Lord. So Elisha knew, knew, I need to remain calm, cool, and collected. Don't be afraid. He knew how powerful God was. And then Elisha says, those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. See, Elisha knew something, and he was about to let his servant in on it. The second thing that Elisha did, he prayed for his servant, which is really his employee. He prayed for those that were under his leadership. So we need to pray for those that we lead. And he prayed right here uh, in verse 17. Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened Elisha's servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, Elisha had seen these horses and chariots before when they came down and took Elijah. He knew, he was able to see this because his faith, so he could see um, you know, God's presence, just like Carrie sang earlier. Let us see more of your presence. Elisha was able to see God's presence. And so he prayed for that for his servant. And then his servants, that helped his servant increase his own faith. And then as the enemy came down toward Elisha, Elisha wasn't scared at all. He was confident. And so he prayed for his own enemy. That's the third thing that we should do. We should always pray for our enemies. He prayed for his enemies, but his prayer was, God, strike them with blindness so they can't see. And so God struck him with blindness, and Elisha walked right out into the middle of them, and he said, hey, the person you're looking for in here, let me take you to him. I know where he's at. So Elisha walked them right into Samaria, the middle of Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel at that time. And as soon as they were in the middle, the Israelites closed the doors and uh, Elisha prayed again, God opened the eyes of these Aramean soldiers. Their eyes were open. They found themselves surrounded and trapped by the Israelites. And so the king of Israel came out and to Elisha and he said, Elisha, what should I do? Should I kill him? Which, if had it been me, I might have said yes, because I don't want to be looking over my shoulder the rest of my life worrying if they're going to come back after me. But that wasn't Elisha. He had faith that, hey, if they want to come back after me, that's fine, but we'll just do all this over again. I'm not afraid of them. So Elisha said, no, would you do that to your own uh, uh, enemies that you've captured? He said, give them a good meal and send them on their way. So that's exactly what they did. They get fed them a good meal, um, and they sent them on their way. And the last verse there says in that passage, uh, the bands of Aram stopped raiding the Israelite army. Man, what faith, what powerful faith. Isn't that the type of leader that you want to serve under? When you have somebody that will pray with you and over you, tells you not to be afraid. You know, I can sit here and give you examples of how I've done it wrong a lot of times, 
But on one occasion when I got it right, I had a, a woman who was my assistant director of student recruitment. This was when I was at Dallas Baptist University. And uh, she was a grandmother and was worried about uh, her, one of her granddaughters. And she had come to me. And this was during a time of late registration enrollment. And so uh, private schools aren't subsidized by the state or the federal government. And so tuition dollars are really relied upon to meet the annual budget. And so she came to me and said, um, I'm worried about this situation. I think I need to take off the rest of the week uh, to handle this. And, um, you know, the selfish side of me was like, oh, no, I mean, we're in late registration. We're so close to beating our numbers. We've got to meet you know, these numbers so that we can make budget. I mean, that's the selfish side of me. But I said uh, to her, do what you need to do. And I said, I don't have the answers to this, but let's go to the one who does. And so I said, let's pray over this. So I prayed with her over that situation. And when we were done praying, you could hear the sigh of relief. She goes, thank you. And she walked out, and that was the end of it. I mean, she stayed there the rest of the week and worked. She just needed somebody to pray with her over that situation and know that there's nothing we can do about this, but God, the Creator, can handle all these situations for us. You know, my daughter, Haley, sometimes she gets a little anxious about things. And when she does, she'll come to me and let me know about it, and I'll just take her in my arms if I'm standing up. Or if I'm just laying down on the bed with her, I'll just wrap her up in my arms. i say, Haley, let's just pray about this. So I'll pray with her over that situation, not really having any answers, but just knowing that God can comfort her. And when I'm done, she'll say, thank you, Daddy. And you can just feel that anxiety and that fear and that worry just melt off her. You know, a number of years ago, I was working for another organization, and uh, I didn't work for a boss who was very kind. And on uh, one particular occasion, we were a couple of months out from a situation that was about to take place. So I, I notified him of a situation. I said, I just want you to be aware this is what's going to happen. This is what I think we should do about it. And his reply back was, no, I don't want to do anything about that. And so I let it go. And about two weeks before the situation, I sent him another message and just said, hey, we just want to remind you this is about to happen. I think we need to do this about it. He said, no, I don't want to do anything about it. So I let it go. About a week after that situation transpired, um, I was talking with another gentleman at the organization who happened to be in a meeting the week before with the president and my boss, the president of that organization. And he said, hey, John, by the way, uh, last week when I was in this meeting, the president asked your boss, why did you not let me know about this situation that was going to happen? And my boss told the president, John never told me about it. Can you imagine when he told me that, how, how angry I was that I'd just been lied, lied about? Oh, I was so mad. And so I went straight back to my office. I typed up this email. I had this chain of emails. I was ready to fire it off to the president to clear my name. But before I send any emails like that, I always like to sleep on it 24 hours. You know? So that's what I did. I typed it all up. I slept on it. Actually, I didn't sleep that night. I was so mad and angry. I didn't sleep all that night. And bitterness began to set in. That next morning, I didn't feel good, didn't feel like I should send that email. But the week went by, and my bitterness began to just grow more and more and more. And I could just, you know, when, that, when you're bitter and you're angry about something, how that acid in your stomach will just begin to turn and turn. And I was losing sleep, and I was just so mad. And so about two weeks went by. I didn't do anything about it. And I was praying with the Lord. I said, God, I'm just so angry about this. I've just been wronged, and I just want to clear my name, and I know I have every right to do this. I'm in the right here. But I knew that if I clear my name, what's going to change? Is he going to let my boss go? I may still have to reply to this gentleman. I may still have to work for him and work with him. So it might not make my situation any more comfortable. And I said, God, I don't know what to do about this, but I got to let this anger go because it's just eating me up. And so I prayed. I said, God, I'm just putting it in your hands. I just put my hands up and just laid it in his hands. I said, God, I just give it over to you because I know you can do far more in this situation than I ever could on my own because Scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll repay, and I trust you that you're going to handle this. And immediately I just felt so much peace. Now, I didn't forget about the situation. I still got a little bit mad and irritated about it when I think of it, but it didn't eat me up like it used to. 
Well, time went on, and I ended up leaving that organization. And about the time I left the organization, a month later, I was on a phone call with a trustee of that organization, because we were friends. And he said, um, hey, by the way, the president uh, of this organization said that if he were to ever to leave, that you would be the first person I need to call and talk to about who should be the next president in the organization. See, my boss aspired to be the next president, and he let that be known. And I thought, when he said it to me, I thought, oh my goodness, it gave me so much satisfaction because here the Lord was placing my enemy in my hands. I could do whatever I wanted. I had a file about this thick I'd been keeping over the years, and I could just present that. And I told him, thank you. If that day ever comes, uh, maybe we'll have that conversation. I didn't say a word. But man, when I hung up the phone, I felt so much satisfaction. Well, a few more months went by, and my old boss, was the Lord removed him from that organization. I never, never had to say a word. I never had to get dirty with that. God took care of all of it. I was in the right. I could, have, I could have sent that email off, but I don't know what the results and the consequences were going to be. And I can be right, or I can be right with God and let God take care of that. And he did. It wasn't in my time. It wasn't in my own way. But years later, man, I have so much satisfaction from that uh, event and how the Lord just was faithful when I was obedient and gave that over to him. In closing today, I just want to ask you if you would just bow your heads and just close your eyes. No, I don't know what your situation looks like. I don't know what your home life looks like. I don't know what your work situation is. I don't know what kind of worries or anxieties or fears you may be facing today, but I can tell you God can handle them all. He can take care of whatever situation you may be going through. He just needs us to be obedient and to trust him and to have faith, just like Elisha, just like that widow. Today you may feel like you're not the leader that you need to be. You may not feel like you're the husband, the father, the, the employer. Maybe the child, the student that you need to be. Today's a great opportunity to make some changes. You don't have to be perfect, but you can continue to work toward the calling and life that God has for you. In a moment, I'm about to pray, and after I do, Brian Anderson and I are going to be down here up front. If you'd like to come down here and pray with one of us, if you'd like to over a situation you may be going through, we'll be happy to pray. I've known Brian for 20 years. There's not a judgmental bone in his body. He would love to pray with you and for you. If you'd like to dedicate your life to the Lord today because you know you haven't been living the kind of life that you should be, and you're tired of living in defeat, we'll be happy to be here and pray with you to make that decision. If you want to join the church today, we'll be happy to speak with you about that. As the musicians come and pray, if you'll just stand uh, up to your feet. And if there's a decision you want to make, don't wait another minute. Don't let another day go by without receiving the full grace.